So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the gift of your word. And I want to thank you that you want to speak to us uh, this morning uh, in powerful ways. So I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come? Uh, would you move in this place? Would you move in our hearts? Um, maybe even now, as you're, as you're sitting in your seat, guys, and maybe just even put a hand in your heart. Uh, just as a symbol that you want the Lord to speak uh, into your heart this morning. Just invite him to move. God, I pray that, that this talk would be about me. That it would be all about Jesus. We pray this in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to pause for a second here. And um, don't, don't make her feel awkward when she comes in. I can see Abigail coming in here. I don't want her to miss <laughs> the talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll just let her come in. Don't, don't draw attention to her. Okay. Super duper. So, uh, this morning's talk is all about faith that speaks life. And in a way, this is a super easy sermon to preach, okay? Why? Because we've all felt the powerful effects of this little thing here. It's the one opportunity I'll have in preaching to stick my tongue out at you guys. But we have all felt the powerful effects of people's words, haven't we? And we've all felt the powerful effects of the words that we've said to other people. We all know what it feels like to be slagged off and slandered by others and to have our reputations utterly destroyed. But likewise, we also know the effects of when we've engaged in gossip and where we have maliciously sought to ruin other people's reputations. We all know the power that lies and half-truths can have over us. Perhaps for you, someone has spoken damaging words over your life, uh, be that a parent or a guardian, a sibling, a family member, a teacher, a colleague, even a close friend. These words have been perhaps so damaging for you that they've dented your confidence, crushed your self-esteem, and maybe they've even altered how you live your life to this day. Maybe they've altered the things that you think you could do with your life. These words are even more hurtful if a church member has spoken them over you. Something deeply hurtful or thoughtless. I want to ask this morning, just before we cast off, what lies do you need to break off in your life? What lies do you need the Spirit of God to break off in your life? I want to encourage you, if something's even coming to mind this morning where someone has spoken something horrible over your life that isn't true, I want to encourage you to go forward for prayer ministry at the front this morning. And I also want to encourage you not just to go forward for prayer ministry, but actually to look at God's word and replace those lies with the transforming truth of God's word. We know how damaging it can feel when we're falsely accused by others and vice versa. We have been the ones who have accused other people too. We have experienced the reckless attacks of other people's words, bullying, and vice versa, we have bullied people with our words too. And then there's the negative atmosphere created by people who grumble. People who are negative all the time. Maybe you've been in a position of authority and you've been undermined by these sorts of words. Or maybe you've been the one doing the undermining. And then we've seen the ugliness of quarreling between people. We've all experienced regret with our words. I know I have. 
things that we've said and we wish we'd never said and we wish we could take back the consequences of the things that we've said, the damage that we've caused with our words. Perhaps there are relationships in your life that are deeply broken because of the words that you have said. So we're going to look at that this morning. That's why we have a picture of some lips with some nails out of mouth here. We don't want to be a people whose words are sharp, painful and damaging. We want to be a people who speak blessing over people. So I want to start this sermon by actually looking at myself because this is where James begins in his words in chapter 3 and verse 1. So he says this, chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So why does he begin with teachers? What James wants to say is all verbal activity can be dangerous. All verbal activity has the power to be dangerous, okay? So James begins with teachers, us guys at the front. Because what is destructive for the teacher can also be harmful for the students. There are a number of things that scripture, the Bible critiques in church leaders and teachers. For starters, Jesus critiques uh, teachers uh, who abuse their power over others. So we read in Matthew 23, 9, 10, these words. Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. So we've got to beware of leaders in church and teachers who love their position and their title above the Lord. Be wary of a church leader who says, look at me. No, no, look to the Messiah. Leaders ought to be humble pointers to Jesus. Yes, we submit to a leader's authority, but there's a balance to be sought here. Leaders are not Jesus, and leaders are not some sort of special guru. As well, Jesus critiques financial abuse and control over others. So in Mark 12, uh, chapter, uh, verse 40, um, it's speaking of the Pharisees here. This is Jesus. He's saying that these Pharisees, these leaders, they devour widows' houses. So he, they abuse uh, these people in poverty. And for a show, they make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. But another way that leaders can abuse their power is this thing. Their words. A leader who slanders, attacks people, who's always tearing down and never building up, accusing people, perhaps grumbling or, or quarreling with others, it damages the community within, the people within the church, and it also damages the witness without, the witness to people outside the church. This is why teaching is such a dangerous gift. If I'm coming to you this morning from the front of church and teaching you lies, it will have a lasting impact on the listener. It will impact what you think and it will impact what you do. If I'm hypocritical in what I teach, that can do lasting damage as well. In our country too, there are those who have married their Christian faith to their politics. I'm thinking a lot of the damage caused and the trouble, troubles um, by uh, both those from a Roman Catholic background and also from the Protestant churches. But I believe what James is saying extends beyond the pulpit. Luke 12, 48 reminds us, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Leaders are naturally under more scrutiny, okay? And so it should be. Moses himself, the great leader, 
tasted the pain of not entering the promised land in Numbers 20 because he disobeyed the Lord. Perhaps for you this morning, a church leader or a preacher or a teacher or a staff member caused you much damage, hurt and pain through their words. Perhaps these were words said behind your back. Perhaps these were words said to your face or perhaps even directly from this place, from the pulpit. I want to just say this morning, sorry, on behalf of the body and bride of Christ, that that was your experience. Because it's not God's heart for you. And I just want to encourage you, as I've said this morning, to seek healing. Go forward for, for prayer if a church leader has abused their position and abused you with their words. Come forward for prayer ministry and receive prayer uh, and we can break off some of those lies this morning or, or let someone walk you through the process of forgiveness for perhaps that person who's caused hurt. I also want to come before you this morning in humility. I am not perfect. No church leader is. I put a lot of work into my teaching to make sure what I'm saying is accurate. But from time to time, I will get it wrong from this place. I will get it wrong in a one-to-one -one with you. I will get it wrong behind your back. My encouragement to us as a church here in Tullycarna is for us to keep shortcuts with each other and healthy relationships. Of course, there will be times when I as a church leader will have to have a difficult conversation. But always know that I will try my utmost to do that from the right heart. And finally, I want to encourage you to pray for me as your leader. Pray for church leaders. It's not easy. There is more pressure. I often feel it. Pray that, that what I would say would be in line with God's heart and truth. And do encourage your leaders with your words as well. So that's a little aside. But what about the rest of us? Maturity in our words. Because James is demanding exactly the same from you as he is from me. And therefore the Lord is demanding exactly the same from you as he does from me. So we're going to look at uh, verses 2 to 8 here. So we started with teachers. But God wants us all to reach a place of maturity in our words. Not just teachers and leaders. So verse 2 on the screen here reminds us that we all stumble in many ways. Hallelujah. There's grace for everyone, even a church leader. We all stumble in many ways. But then he goes on to say this, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So I recently joined a new gym, okay? I know it doesn't look like a workout, but I've joined a gym. It's clean, it's well run, people are friendly. And they're also absolutely massive, okay? <laughs> Compared to me, at least. I'm just so glad I'm not small. I would just, I would just, I would just take the biscuits. Um, if you want to be muscular and robust in your faith, in the same way these guys at the gym are muscular and robust in their physique, we need to reach a place of maturity in our words. I think the tongue is technically your strongest muscle in your body. Correct me if I'm wrong. We need to learn how to work this muscle here for good. So if you're here this morning in church, I'm assuming you want to grow. I'm assuming you want to become stronger in your faith and that you want to grow up in your faith. And one of the ways that we do this as Christians is through our words. Proverbs 10, 19 reminds us that sin is not ended by multiplying words. So if you're in a situation where you maybe argued with someone or um, maybe you have said the wrong thing, that situation isn't going to be solved by more damaging words, a war of words. It's going to be solved by you being careful 
with what you say, but the prudent hold their tongue. The prudent hold their tongues. So if you want to be complete, if you want to be mature, if you want to be whole in your faith, learn how, through the Spirit's power and help, to keep your words in check. For everyone, it will give your witness to non-Christians real integrity. To explain himself, James gives us a couple of really powerful examples. So in verse 3, it says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Now for those of us this morning who are city dwellers, um, what is this about horses that James is talking about? So we're going to see on the screen here what we're talking about. So these, see this bit here in the horse's mouth? That's what James is talking about. When you have this in a well-trained horse's mouth, you can control that horse and make it do what you want it to do. And you can do amazing things with that horse and control where they go. The invitation here in our passage is not to be like wild horses. You're near enough impossible to control and can leave you bitten, kicked and trod on. A teacher who can control his or her mouth can lead and steer the body of Christ, the church. A Christian who can't control their mouth isn't going to go far. Your witness is going to stink for starters. By the way, non-Christians can sense and see this stuff a mile off. Lack of control in your words can sow bitterness within the church community and it can kill what should be a warm, friendly atmosphere what should be a family atmosphere. Unconstructive words under the guise of, I'm just being honest, can cause real damage. How's about we think before we speak to each other? I think as well, it's not just the content of what we say. I think it's also about being honest, being people of integrity. Dishonesty and lies can hurt people too. When you say you're going to do something but don't do it. Or when you have an ulterior motive. Psalm 12, 2 to 5 speaks a little into that. So the psalmist here says, everyone lies to their neighbour. It should not be. It should be a people of truth. They flatter with their lips but harbour deception in their hearts. So that's thinking one thing here and saying something totally different out here. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we will prevail and our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the needy groom, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. I will protect them from those who badmouth them. Then there's this other image of a boat, okay? James talks about a boat. Or take ships for an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So we had a picture of a boat here on the screen and a rudder, a tiny part of the boat. The tongue is a tiny part of our body. A bit like this rudder on the screen here. Tiny but so vital. Who here has ever been in the swans in Bangor? I'm a Bangor boy, so of course I have. And I have this enduring memory as a teenager, going on the swans after school with some school friends, and halfway out in sort of the pool, the rudder broke on this swan thing. So we're out in the middle, and we're going round and round and round and round in circles. It's kind of funny. It didn't help that one of the larger kids in school was on the swan too. I thought we were going to sink out there. So will you. If we don't learn to control this thing, you will go round and round in circles in your Christian walk. You'll go round and round in circles giving a poor witness. Non-Christians will go, that person's words. I'm not sure about that. Not very loving. You'll cheat people off. 
unless you learn to use your tongue in the beautiful way that it was made to function in the first place. And we're going to talk about, uh, in a second, how we can use our words for good. Verses 5 to 6, another powerful image. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider a great forest is set in fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. So if you look at a flame, they look a bit like a tongue. They flicker like a tongue. Flames make noises like tongues. And above all else, flames and tongues cause damage. We've talked a little bit about that this morning. It only takes one tree to make a thousand matches. Only takes one match to burn a thousand trees. Only takes one silly barbecue in the Moor Mountains to burn the whole thing down. Only takes one silly sentence to cause irreparable damage to your relationship. Again, the Old Testament agrees with what James says, Proverbs 16, 27. A scoundrel plots evil and on their lips it is like a scorching fire. The picture here is of ever widening impact because we're all connected as human beings. Our words that can damage one person can go on to damage people that we've never even met. Continuing on at verse 7 in our passage, it says this All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed, and they have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. Don't you think that it's amazing that humans can train dogs and all sorts of animals to be obedient and do amazing things? But we haven't learned to train ourselves. It's like God gave us authority over the animals in Genesis chapter 1, but we don't have a clue how to do that for ourselves. Now, of course, that's because of sin. And praise God for Jesus. Praise God that through the cross, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven for our words. And we can be cleansed by his words of life. We want to be like a well-disciplined animal in the power of the Spirit. But unfortunately, a lot of the time, we're more like this guy with our words. We're more like Taz, the Tasmanian devil. Totally out of control, unstable in our words, speaking death, not life. Often the Old Testament describes hurtful words in the language of venom from snakes. We don't want to be like snakes and give you a poisonous bite with their mouths. We want to be people who speak words of blessing and hope. Encouragement. So, where do we go from here? I hold to a really strong conviction that Jesus way is better. That in Jesus' kingdom of love, there is a better way, there is a better life to which we are called, a wonderful way, an excellent counter-cultural way. Nowadays, when people uh, have a problem, they go on Twitter and they say whatever they like. Christians don't do that. We were designed with a tongue to speak life over people. Let's continue and read the final section of our passage. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James here challenges us with perhaps the most challenging words in Scripture. Perhaps the most challenging thought in Scripture around words. Out of this thing, the most loving words that can ever be said can come out. 
Words about Jesus, words about the greatest expression of love for humankind. The cross, we have it sitting in the corner of our room here. The fact that Jesus Christ loved this world so much that he went willingly to the cross to die in our place, to pay for our sin, guilt, and shame, and to restore a relationship with our Father God. Out of this thing, those words of love and grace can come. But as well, out of this thing, the most painful words can come. I think of uh, even a marriage. Out of my own mouth, I've said wonderful things to Kirsty, but also out of my own mouth, I've said things that are deeply hurtful and deeply painful. James says the Christian cannot be this way. As I said this morning, a number of us were at the New Wine Conference last week, all week in Sligo. It was great fun. And I think for me, the simple takeaway from the morning Bible sessions, at least for me, was that the church, the bride of Christ, if it is to see renewal and revival in this land, it's got to be utterly captivated by the person of Jesus. You've got to be head over heels in love with Jesus, in love with who he is and what he has done on the cross for us. I believe that if we are utterly captivated by Jesus, I believe words of blessing will come out of our mouths because we will be daily reminded how much Jesus loves us, but also how much Jesus loves everybody else. The great C.T. Studd, apparently he was a great cricketer, a very smart man, but he also was a very great missionary. Went to China, went to Africa, he was all over. Amazing guy. He said this, whatever moves the heart, wags the tongue. Whatever moves the heart, wags the tongue. Does Jesus move your heart? Does he? Has he captivated your heart? Does his love captivate your heart? Because if he does, beauty, love, honesty, integrity, it's going to come out of this thing. For James, it's an insult to the creator. We're bad bad mouthing his creations. We are called as Christians to something counter-cultural. We don't go on Twitter and badmouth people. We don't badmouth them to their faces. Luke 6, 28 says, even in a situation where people are going against us, we speak words of blessing. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Words of love. First John 420 admonishes us, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. We speak life. We don't speak death over people, we speak life. Because we're so captivated by his love story. We're so captivated by the cross and that great love poured out for us there. So as we come in for a landing this morning, how are we going to do this? How can we be a people who speak life and truth and blessing over people? How are we going to do this? So I have some suggestions on the screen for us this morning. Choosing to be encouraging Some of these might seem really obvious to you this morning, but if we're all honest, sometimes we're not very good at it. Choosing to be encouraging. And it's not just saying, oh, Ali, great worship this morning. Good word, Matthew. It's being specific. Otherwise it means nothing. You're just being polite. Don't just go up to someone and say, oh, nice worship. Good, good screen flicking today, Stephen. 
Good talk. Be specific. Ali, thank you for sharing something that God put in your heart devotionally with us this morning. I was really built up and really encouraged by that this morning. Thank you for putting the effort into that. Thank you for being sensitive to what God was doing in the room. Choosing to be positive, in our words, choosing positivity, instead of being divisive, instead of quarreling, instead of defaulting to the negative, how can your words reflect a bit of positivity? There are some people in this room for which this will be easy. Don't you hate just those glass half full people? For me, this is tricky. I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. That's why I married a glass half full kind of girl. But I believe that we can press into this with the help of the Holy Spirit. Are your words constructive? Something that I especially hate to see are critical Christians. Uh, it just wasn't a very cool church. Uh, speaker wasn't great. Uh, Why don't you get up to the front and, and do a sermon? I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> as far as James is concerned, and what we've read this morning, critical Christians don't exist. Let's aim to be an Ephesians 4, 29 kind of people. When it says this, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your lips, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. What good is it if you say, oh, I didn't like the coffee this morning in church. What benefit is that? It's going to hurt the person who made it in the first place, who's got up early to do it for you. Come on. Let's be constructive and positive in our words. Are my words loving? It's a great question to ask, particularly when you have to have a difficult conversation. Because James isn't saying, just be happy, clappy, avoid conflict and avoid the difficult conversation. He's not saying that to us this morning in the passage. What he is saying here is guard your heart, okay? Guard your heart. Ask before you say something to someone, am I saying this from the place of love? Or am I saying this because I have beef? Okay? Be intentional. We were called and made to speak life over people. Be intentional. Strategize how your words can advance God's kingdom. Think this week, who can I encourage and build up in the workplace? Who can I build up and encourage in school or university? A friend or a family member, a neighbor? Maybe someone in church. And ask, how can I share the good news about Jesus, the gospel in a way that will enrapture someone else's heart in the love of God. Be intentional in what you say to others. And finally, ask the question, do my words have weight and integrity? Or am I hiding from 